Well, this morning I am in the third week of a sermon series that I've entitled, The Cross, Why the Death of Jesus Matters. And as we head towards Easter, my hope is uh, to look at the cross and the death of Jesus and what that means for us and for the world. And I've used a quote that I think is very helpful as we go through this series. It says this, we never move on from the cross, only into a more profound understanding of the cross. Sometimes as Christians, you think like the cross is where you come into faith, and then we move on from the cross to how to live as a Christian. But the truth is that the gospel is central to everything, and the cross is central to everything. And so we're going to look at the cross again this morning. Where we've been the last two weeks, in case you missed it, two weeks ago, we looked at the concept of sin and what sin is, rebellion against God, falling short of his holy standard and the brokenness that's within us, and how Jesus, in his death on the cross, paid the penalty for our sins and made a way for us to be right with God. And last week, we looked at suffering and what the cross has to say about our suffering and about the problem of evil. And so I encourage you, if you want to learn more, uh, you can go back on our website or on the church app and you can learn about those things. But this morning, I want to focus on the word grace and what the cross has to teach us about grace the transforming power of grace that we see at the cross. And I'm going to offer a definition of what grace is. I'm going to look at three kinds of grace that we find offered to us at the cross. And then we'll talk about how to receive God's grace. Okay, so we're going to talk about grace, how this life-transforming grace is seen at the cross. So let me just begin with a definition of what grace is. Um, the best definition that I have found was by Tim Keller, uh, the late pastor of Redeemer Presbyterian in New York City. He said, grace is an undeserved gift given by an unobligated giver. I like that definition. Grace is an undeserved gift given by an unobligated giver. So you've got we, uh, people who don't deserve anything and someone who doesn't owe you anything but gives freely anyways. And you think about those two concepts. You think sometimes you might have... Uh, Someone who deserves a gift, maybe, but you're not obligated. Like, like for example, maybe your, your community group leader, right? You're not obligated to give them anything, but they're deserving because of the great job they do, and so you want to give them a gift to bless them. Or you might think of maybe someone who's undeserving, but you're obligated. Parents, maybe, come to mind. Sometimes you feel like your children might not deserve something good, but you're obligated because you're their parents, and so you love and you give to them. Here at the cross, we see the most beautiful example of this kind of grace, where we have the unobligated giver, that is God who owes us nothing, and we are the undeserving recipients. We deserve nothing. Our sin has separated us from God. Our rebellion against God has put us in a place where we're deserving of eternal separation. We've offended a holy God, and yet, in his grace, God gives his son Jesus to die for us, an undeserved gift given by an unobligated giver. So my prayer as we come to the cross is that you would come to a deeper understanding of that grace, that undeserved gift that has been given to you by this unobligated giver. So three types of grace that we see at the cross that I want to focus on this morning. The first is this, perfect love that covers all of your guilt and shame. That at the cross is offered perfect love that covers all of your guilt and shame. I mean, think about it. When you look at the cross, you look at Jesus up there dying for your sins, what do you see? There's two seemingly contradictory truths that you see up there that when they're brought together, transform your life. The first truth, which I covered in greater detail in the first sermon in the series, is that you're so wicked, so full of sin, and evil, that nothing less than the death of the Son of God could save you. So looking at this cross, seeing Jesus dying there, asking, what does this mean? The first thing it means is that you're so full of sin and evil that you could not save yourself, you could not make yourself right with God by your own good works, that nothing less than the death of God's Son could save you. Think of what Paul said in Romans chapter 3. 20 to 24, therefore no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. 
And this righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Do you understand what he's saying there? He says, no one is going to be declared righteous, right with God, on the basis of the works of the law, on the basis of your goodness. No amount of going to church, giving to the poor, doing good things for other people will ever make you right with God, he says. Rather, he says, the law makes us conscious of sin. It shows us that we have fallen short of God's holy standard. But, he says, the good news is that God has made a way to be right with him that doesn't depend upon how good you are. It doesn't depend upon your good works. He says it comes by faith in Jesus Christ to all who believes. He says there's no difference. We've all sinned and fallen short. We've all failed to measure up to God's holy standard. But we're justified, made, declared righteous, declared not guilty by a holy God, by his grace. So the first truth you see when you look at that cross is that you could not save yourself, that you're so wicked and sinful that nothing less than the death of the Son of God could save you. I mean, make no mistake, there is a God who knows you completely, knows everything about you. Hebrews 4 says, nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Everything you've ever thought, everything you've ever done, he knows. Every good thing, every bad thing. And we've all sinned and fallen short of God's glory. But there's a second truth, thank God, right? The first truth, you look at that cross and you see that we're so full of sin and evilness, evil and wickedness that nothing less than the death of the Son of God could save us. But the second truth is that you are so loved, you're so loved that Jesus willingly gave his life for you. And at first it seems contradictory. Wait, you're saying I'm so full of sin and evil and wickedness, but you're also saying I'm so loved that he died willingly for me. John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And Hebrews 12, 1 through 3 says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. I put that one up there because it says to fix our eyes on Jesus, and it says for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. And as I'm fond of saying, what was the joy set before him? It wasn't heaven. He already had that and gave it up to come down here. It wasn't God. He already is God and was with God the Father forever. The joy that was set before him was the one thing he did not have, and that was you. That was what gave him the perseverance to endure the cross, scorn its shame, was to have you restored to him, to a right relationship with him. That is the depth of his love for you, that when you look at that cross, you see the depth of God's love for you, the, how far he was willing to go to save you, the bloody sacrificial death that he was willing to undergo that you might be saved. And so you have these two contradictory things when you look at the cross. It seems contradictory. On the one hand, it is telling you that you cannot save yourselves by your own good works. No amount of prayer and fasting and almsgiving and all of that stuff, right? None of it can save you. That only the death of the Son of God could save you. But he did it willingly for you. He gave his life because he loves you. How does that transform you when you truly understand that? When you truly come to grips with that, that on the one hand, you're so wicked that nothing less than the death of the Son of God could save you, but on the other hand, you're so loved that he willingly gave his life for you. How does that transform you when you truly understand that? When you realize you've done absolutely nothing to earn his favor, and yet he gives it to you freely, that you're an undeserving recipient, and he's an unobligated giver, but he gives his best, his son. What does that do for your heart when you realize that every good thing in your life, especially your salvation, is an undeserved gift of God's grace? I think, first of all, it humbles you. 
It humbles you into realizing that you are no better than anyone else. You have no cause to look down on anyone else, that you did not earn your salvation. You're no smarter. You're no more moral than anyone else. That didn't, that's not what saved you. So it humbles you. You can't look down on anyone else. You didn't earn. You can't boast about it. But on the other hand, it elevates you because that is how loved you are. That there is a God who knows every single thing about you and did not reject you, but instead gave his life for you. Romans 5, 6 through 8 says, You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. When you were at your worst, God gave his best. When you were in your sin, he says, he gave his son to die for you. And now you are his beloved child. And now that you are his beloved child, will he not give you everything that you need? When you truly understand grace, when you understand the gospel, understand that you did nothing to deserve salvation, and yet he gives it to you because he loves you. It humbles and exalts you at the same time. It gives you this humble confidence where you can't boast about anything, you don't look down on anyone else, and yet you're loved. You know you're loved. You know there's nothing that you could do to separate yourself from God. And when you think about it, that is what your heart is longing for, whether or not you're aware of it. This is what we go around looking to other people to do for us so often, looking for people to know us completely and love us fully, to know everything about us and not reject us, but to love us, to show us grace. Tim Keller put it this way in The Meaning of Marriage. He said, to be loved but not known is comforting but superficial. To be known and not loved is our greatest fear. But to be fully known and truly loved is, well, a lot like being loved by God. It is what we need more than anything. It liberates us from pretense, humbles us out of our self-righteousness, and fortifies us for any difficulty life can throw at us. Does that make sense? This is, on the one hand, if someone loves you but they don't really know you, it's comforting, but it's superficial. You still have that nagging doubt that if they truly knew the real me, they wouldn't love me. They'd reject me. If they really knew all the things that I've done and all the things that I think and all of that garbage in me, if they really knew me, they'd reject me. But he says our greatest fear is then to be known and not loved, to actually un you know, un be honest about ourselves and have someone oof, run screaming from us. Say, no thanks. That's the greatest fear, he says. But to be known fully and loved, that, that's godly love. And the thing is, I, as I look at our culture, as I look at our world, what, so much of what our culture believes we, people need is high self-esteem, right? People need to be told that they're special, that they're perfect just the way they are, that if anyone has an issue with you, well, it's their problem. They just need to learn to accept the perfect snowflake that you are embrace you, right? But it's a superficial love. That is the superficial kind of love. It's not based on knowledge. It's just kind of a false esteem. But what your heart truly needs is to be known completely in all its flaws, in all its gunk, in, in, in all its messed up ways, and to be loved for who you are with a grace, with a love that covers over those sins and flaws. I mean, what would it look like for you to confess all of your worst stuff to someone and have them meet you with, I love you. I'm here for you. I'm on your side. Is that not what our hearts long for? To be known fully and loved completely. And as he says, it, it would liberate us from our pretense. We don't need to be, pretend to be someone we're not because we know that even when we're honest, we're loved. It humbles us out of our self-righteousness. We don't need to look down on anyone else or judge anyone else because we're honest about ourselves. We know the baggage that we have, but we're still loved by God. And we don't need, and it says, and we fort it fortifies us for any difficulty life can throw out our, our way. 
Or as 1 John 4.18 puts it, there is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. In other words, where there's still fear, we haven't truly yet received the depth of God's love for us, that grace that covers over all of our sins. Because grace doesn't say, hey, you're perfect just the way you are. That's not what grace says. Grace says, you're far from perfect, but you're loved with a perfect love. And that perfect love can perfect you. Does that make sense? Grace doesn't say you're perfect just the way you are. Grace says you are far from perfect, but you are loved with a perfect love, and this perfect love can perfect you. Ephesians 2, 8 through 9, Paul said, It is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by work, so that no one can boast. Seriously, Christians should be the most humble people they are. There should be no pride. There should be no judgment. Complete humility there should be. If you truly are honest about your sin and you're not afraid to look within, but you see that Jesus loves you so much that he died for you and all of that, you don't need to be pretend to be someone you're not. You don't need to look down on others. When you look at the cross, you see the most obvious example of this because Jesus was not the only one who was crucified that day. There was two others who, was, who were crucified along with him. And Luke chapter 23 tells us one of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. And then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, truly I tell you, today you'll be with me in paradise. Is that not the perfect example of what we're talking about here, of grace? You have this man on the cross here who hasn't done anything up to this point to earn heaven, salvation. He's not going to do anything after this because he's about to die on the cross. And yet he recognizes Jesus for who he is, that he is a king who does not deserve to die and can save him from death. And he also confesses his own sin. We deserve to die. He's honest about who he is, and he receives the grace of God. And Jesus says, today you'll be with me in paradise. It's a perfect illustration there of what we're talking about, how radical the grace of God is. This is the life-transforming grace we find at the cross. There is a perfect love available to you that covers over all your guilt and shame, that knows you fully and can love you completely. The second thing, though, the second aspect of this grace is that it gives us power to change. This grace of God does not just forgive, but it heals and it transforms. Think of 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Not just forgiveness, but purifying. Transforming us from our sin to holiness. Or Romans 2.4, consider what Paul said here. Do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, forbearance, and patience, not realizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance? It's always been an interesting phrase to me. Because it's not saying that it's, don't you realize it's God's wrath that leads you to repentance, right? It's fear of hell that leads you to repentance. But it's God's kindness that leads you to repentance. It's his grace. It's his love displayed on the cross that leads you to repentance. Think about it. The law, don't kill, don't steal, don't bear false witness, all that. The law, that can shape you to some extent by appealing to your fear to your pride, to guilt, fall in line or you will be punished. Or fall in line and I'll tell you what a good boy or good girl you are. Right? I mean, the law can discipline, it can shape you by getting you to fall in line out of fear, out of guilt, out of pride. But the law cannot change your heart. Just because you see a, a, a do not steal doesn't change your heart to then not want to steal. Usually it has the opposite effect, right? Usually you see a law and then you want to break that law. The law has no power to transform your heart. That's grace. That is what grace does. 
That is what the gospel, the love of God does. The kindness of God that leads to repentance. Titus 2.12 puts it this way, For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people, and it teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. Read that again. It just it seems counterintuitive. How does his undeserved love and forgiveness lead us to say no to ungodliness? Wouldn't it be the opposite? Wouldn't you expect that if, if I said all your sins are forgiven, then you would just say, well, then I can go do whatever I want and I'm just forgiven, right? But he says a true understanding of the grace of God will lead you it says, to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions. Why is that? How, does that? how does that work? This is how it works. As you look at the cross, as you come to understand Jesus' death for you and his love for you, your, his undeserved grace given to you, it changes your heart. You realize that God is good and he loves you no matter what that you can trust him, that the plans he has for you are for good, that his will is for your good. You want to honor him, the one who gave his life for you, to give yourself for him, that he might be glorified for what he's done for you. It changes your heart. It changes your motivation. It's not about fear. It's not about pride. It's not about guilt. It is about love. It is about a desire to honor him. Romans 6, 11 and 14 puts it this way. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness. Rather, offer yourselves to God as those who've been brought from death to life. And offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. For sin shall no longer be your master because you are not under the law but under grace. You might think of a couple analogies. Like, for example, in, high, in college I took music appreciation. And in music appreciation class I had to listen to specific genres of music that I didn't really care for. But I listened to because I wanted to get a good grade. And now that I'm older, I listen to some of that music because I want to. Not in order to get a grade but because I love, my motivation has changed. It's just because I love that music. Or think about Spanish. I studied Spanish in high school, and I don't think I've studied Spanish since high school. I studied Spanish in order to get a good grade on a test so I could get to college. And you think, what might propel you as an adult to study Spanish? You know, What might make you want to study Spanish? I would say, if you fell in love with someone who only spoke Spanish, you would be motivated to learn Spanish, not because you need to get a good grade on a test, but out of love, out of a desire to, to know and communicate with the one you love. That's how motivation changes. Again, like if you were taking Spanish and your teacher told you, hey, you've already got an A. Whatever you do on the test, you got an A. I mean, most of us would not study, but if you love someone who spoke Spanish, you would study. You would learn that language as best as you can. And that is what we're talking about here. At the cross, Jesus has forgiven all of your sins, past, present, and future. Grace, undeserved gift from an unobligated giver. His perfect love has covered all of your sin, all of your shame, all of your guilt. You're free from condemnation, free from hell, free from guilt, from fear, from shame. So why not just go and do whatever you want? Go live however you want. Because if you understand the gospel, if you understand the grace of God, if you truly have received him as your savior, your motivation starts to change. Your heart starts to change. It's not out of fear and guilt. It's out of a desire to love and obey and honor him that you live for him. Or as Matthew 13 puts it, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again and then in his joy, he went and he sold all he had, and he bought that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. And when he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. Everything. 
There's nothing else I want anymore. All I want is you. All I want is Jesus. I believe that I am saved by grace. I believe that I could go out right now and I could murder someone. And that Jesus' death has covered that sin. I believe I could go out and do all kinds of sins. But my motivation and my heart has changed. I don't want to do those things because I trust that God is good. That his will for me is good. That I want to honor him in everything that I say and do. And it's not out of fear. It's not out of guilt. It's not out of shame. It's not out of pride. It is just out of a desire to honor him. And that's what so many people just don't understand about Christianity, about the gospel. Those who look from outside and say, oh, people are just afraid of hell or something like that, right? You know? You're living with this fear. Jesus died for my sins, and that fear is gone. The guilt is gone. The shame is gone. Now the motivation has changed. The heart has changed, and it's a desire to honor him. Thomas Chalmers put it this way. No one changes a habit just by trying, oh, I shouldn't be like that. The only way to dispossess an old affection is by the expulsive power of a new affection. In other words, that's how we change the new affection, a new affection, a new desire for God that sends away that desire we had for addiction, for sin, for all those other things. Best phrase I've heard for what it means to be saved is, I've been seized by the power of a great affection. Isn't that great? I've been seized by the power of a great affection. It's God's grace, it's God's love that has seized me, that is casting out every other desire so that I just want to honor him. So the life-transforming power of grace that is offered to you at the cross, perfect love that covers all your guilt and shame, the power to change, and then a grace that you can extend to others. Because the more clearly you see your unworthiness and God's free gift of love to you and forgiveness to you, the more that you are empowered to show grace to others who do not deserve it. Ephesians 4.32, Paul says, Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. So often in the New Testament, forgiveness and grace that we're supposed to show to others is linked to the forgiveness and grace that God has shown to us, right? That that is where the power comes from. As we see the depth of our sin and the depth of his forgiveness and love towards us, it transforms our heart that we can show that same grace to others who do not deserve it. We can forgive those who do not deserve it. My understanding of grace and forgiveness is that God's desire is that we would be ready to show grace and forgiveness to everyone. However, as we see, God offers grace and forgiveness, but... It's not received until someone repents and receives it, turns from sin to receive that grace, that forgiveness. And in the same way, I think God's desire is that we would be ready and willing to offer grace and forgiveness to everyone, but they're not actually forgiven until they repent and receive that grace and forgiveness. The forgiveness has to be received. But God's desire is that you would be a person of grace and forgiveness as he's shown you grace and forgiveness. Think of Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times. Jesus answered, I tell you not seven times, but 77 times. In other words, stop counting. Just think of God's forgiveness towards you and how many times you have come and asked forgiveness for the same thing and how many times he has forgiven you. He says, now go and do likewise. How are you going to find that kind of grace and forgiveness unless you receive that from him, unless you see the depth of your sin and the depth of his grace and forgiveness for you? So the last thing I want to say is about this then. How do we receive God's grace? If this is the grace that is offered to each and every one of you, how do you receive it? Because there's two errors you can fall into, two opposite errors you can fall into when it comes to God's grace. The first is to think that you don't need grace, that you can earn your way to God, that just by your prayers and almsgiving and tithes and good works and all of that, that you can make yourself right with God. That is the first error that you can fall into. And hopefully I've disabused you of that notion this morning. You can't save yourself. But there's an, another error. The other error is to think that grace is just given to everyone at the cross and everyone gets it for free, no matter what you've done or haven't done, and, and there's nothing you need to do to receive it. 
Yeah, you can just keep going merrily your own way, and his grace covers. C.S. Lewis put it this way. He said, St. Augustine says, God gives where he finds empty hands. A man whose hands are full of parcels can't receive a gift. In other words, he gives where there's someone willing to receive that grace. If you don't want it, it's not yours. Matthew 5, 3 tells us, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The poor in spirit are those who are spiritually bankrupt, who know they've got nothing to offer to save themselves. They're beggars in need of help from God. They let go of their sin. They let go of their self-centeredness, their self-justification. They give up control of their life. They come to God empty-handed, not grasping onto anything, not holding onto anything, saying, this is mine. You can't have it. Some of you, God is offering you grace upon grace, all of this perfect love and eternal life. He is offering it to you, and you don't have it. You have not received it because you're still hanging on to your own stuff, your own sin, your own control, your own self-centeredness. And his encouragement this morning is to let go. Repent of your sin. Let go of it. Let go of your self control and justification. Let go of the things you think are yours and receive his grace that is far better than anything that you could hold on to in this world. Acts 2.38, Peter replied, this is at the end of the Pentecost sermon, he says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And in the next chapter he says, repent then and turn to God that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come to the Lord, from the Lord. To repent is to turn from sin to God, to confess, to lay it down, and to turn and receive from God his grace. Jonah chapter 2, 8 through 9, I love the way he puts it. He says, those who cling to worthless idols forfeit the grace that could be theirs. But I, with a song of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will make good. Salvation comes from the Lord. God offers you grace upon grace at the cross. The power to change, perfect love that covers all your sin, all of your shame, all of your guilt, eternal life, joy, peace, purpose in life. All of this is offered to you freely through Jesus. But if you're clinging to worthless idols, if you're holding on to other things, if you're looking to other things to save you, holding on to sin, holding on to your own control, He says, those who cling to worthless idols forfeit the grace that could be theirs. I don't want you to forfeit the grace that could be yours. To have Jesus holding out his hands with all of this gift towards you and you saying, no, I'm going to hang on to my own. Thank you very much. Let go. Open your hands and let go. Turn from sin. Turn from self-centeredness. Turn from self-control. Turn from all of that this morning and let go and receive his grace this morning. Receive his salvation. And if he has shown you that kind of grace, then let it flow through you and show grace to others. Let me pray, and then we're going to respond and worship as the worship team comes forward. This morning, Lord, we let go of everything that we've been holding on to. We let go of control. We let go of our own ways that we've tried to justify ourselves and make ourselves right with you. We let go of our sin. We let go of our self-centeredness. We let go of our rights. We turn to you and ask that you would give us your grace, your salvation. It's an undeserved gift given by an unobligated giver. And you offer us eternal life, forgiveness of sins, perfect love, purpose and meaning in life, peace and joy and love beyond anything this world can offer. So, Lord, pour out your grace into our hearts this morning. Transform us that our desires might not be out of fear or guilt or pride, but instead out of just a desire to honor you, to love you as you've loved us. Thank you, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.